Let's review the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Suppose n is an integer larger than 1. Then first we say n is either a prime or it's a product of primes. And the second thing we can say is that the factorization of n into a product of primes is unique, except for the order of the factors. So let's look at an example. Suppose I have the number 1,650, and I'm going to write this as a product of primes because this itself is not a prime number. And so I'm going to write this as 2 to the first power times 3 to the first power times 5 to the second power, so I have two fives there, times 7 to the zero power, and I'll show you why I'm going to do that in a second, and then 11 to the first power, and then I'm also going to have a 13 to the zero power. Okay, so you multiply all these together, you would end up getting 1,650. And let's look at another example, how about 1,820? So in this case, I can write this as 2 to the second power times 3 to the zeroth power times 5 to the first power times 7 to the first power times 11 to the zeroth power and then 13 to the first power. Okay. So why did I do this? Well, I want to now go ahead and look at these two numbers and ask, what if I looked at each one of these powers and in each case, I took the smaller of the two? In other words, if I have two to the first and two to the second, if I had to choose between those, I'm gonna take two to the first because that's the smaller one. And then if I look at three to the first and three to the zero, I'm gonna take three to zero because again, that's the smaller one. And I keep doing this as I go down the line here and I take the smaller one each time. And what do I get? So after you do this, you see that we only have a 5 and a 2 left, so that equals 10. And this ends up being the greatest common divisor. So we've seen how to get the greatest common divisor before, so here's a way to do it that uses the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now this time though, what if instead of taking the smaller of the two, I took the larger of the two? So if I had to choose between 2 to the 1st and 2 to the 2nd, I would take 2 to the 2nd. And then here, I'll take 3 to the 1st. And then here, I'll take 5 to the 2nd. And then here, I'll take 7 to the 1st. And then here, I'll take 11 to the 1st. And here, I'll take 13 to the 1st. So as you can imagine, this is going to be a much larger number. In fact, this is what it ends up being. We have 300300 zero, zero, three, zero, zero, when you multiply all these together. And this thing has a name. This is called the least common multiple. So let's define that. What is the least common multiple? So the least common multiple works like this. Let a and b be any two integers as long as they're not both zero. Then an integer m, which is greater than or equal to one, is called a least common multiple of a and b if the following properties hold. First, a divides m and b divides m. And second, for any integer n, if a divides n and b divides n, then m divides n. And so you, uh, if you remember the definition that we had for greatest common divisor, this definition is very similar. And we have some notation for this. We say that the least common multiple, or the LCM, of a and b is equal to m. So if we wanted to look at an example here, let's look at, say, 168, and we'll look at 490. So again, to calculate the least common multiple, we can use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and write these each as a product of primes. So this one, 168, we can write it as 2, and then it's going to be to the third power, times 3 to the first power, times 5 to the zeroth power, and then 7 to the first power. And then 490, we can write that as 2 to the first power times 3 to the zeroth power times 5 to the first power times 7 to the second power. And then we take the larger of each of these. So I would have, in this case, 2 cubed, 3 to the first, 5 to the first, and 7 to the uh, second power. And when you multiply all these together, you end up getting 5,000. 880. So we can say that the least common multiple of 168 and 490 is 5880. And I'll leave it to you to verify for these numbers that these two properties do indeed hold. 
So let's look at some things that we can prove with this definition of least common multiple. So here's the definition, and here's the first thing I want to look at. Suppose that a and b are positive integers, and that lowercase m equals the least common multiple of a and b. Then, if the uppercase m is any other common multiple of a and b, then the lowercase m divides the uppercase m. So let's look at an outline of this proof. So the first thing I'm going to note is that this lowercase m here has to be less than or equal to the uppercase m. Because remember, this is the m, the lowercase m is the least common multiple. So if these are both multiples, I know that the uppercase m has to be larger. Okay, and what am I trying to show here? Well, I must show that, let's see, it looks like I'm trying to show something dividing here. I have to show that the lowercase m divides the uppercase m, or in other words, that the uppercase m equals q times the lowercase m, where q has to be some integer. So q is an integer here. Okay, so how can I do this? Well, this kind of looks like maybe the division algorithm without a remainder. In other words, uh, I can write m as lowercase q, lowercase m, plus r, where we have r less than or greater, I'm sorry, r is greater than or equal to zero or less than lowercase m. And that's by division algorithm, so I really want to show that this implies that r is zero. That's somehow I have to show that, so how am I going to do that? Okay, um, well, I guess I can solve this for r. If I do that, I get m minus qm, okay. And this and this, the big M and the lowercase m, I know that those are both multiples of a and b. That's uh, something that I had in the, in the beginning here. So if that's true, then that means that r is a common multiple of a and b also. So that that's, uh, comes from knowing that big M and little m are both uh, multiples of a and b. Okay, and what else do I know? Well, r is a common multiple of a and b, and remember that r is less than m up here, but m was the least common multiple, this thing right here. And so I must actually have the case where r is zero because uh, if r were a common multiple of a and b and it were less than lowercase m, something would be wrong here because then m would no longer be the least common multiple. Okay, I think we're ready for a proof. Okay, so here is the proof. I'm gonna note that since m is the least common multiple, lowercase m has to be less than or equal to uppercase m. And by the division algorithm, there exist integers q and r such that m equals q times m plus r, where r here is greater than or equal to zero, but less than the little m. So r then is the big M minus q times the little m. But remember that lowercase m and uppercase m are both multiples of a, so r must also be a multiple of a. And similarly, since both the m's are multiples of b, r must also be a multiple of b. So r is a common multiple of a and b. But remember that little m was the least common multiple of a and b. And since r is greater than or equal to zero but less than m, we must have r equals zero. And therefore, big M equals Q times little m, and M little m divides big M, and I have shown what I wanted to show. Okay, here's something else I wanna try and prove. Suppose that A and B are positive integers. Then the greatest common divisor of A and B times the least common multiple of A and B equals A times B. So let's look at an example first. So earlier we looked at the numbers 168, and we looked at the number, uh, and number 490. So we saw before that 168 can be written as 2 cubed times 3 to the first times 5 to the 0 power times 7 to the first power. And 490 was 2 to the first times 3 to the 0 times 5 to the first times 7 to the second. Okay, and so if we go ahead and take the largest of each of these, 2 cubed times 3 to the first times 5 to the first, times seven to the second, we end up getting the least common multiple, which we saw was 5,880. But if we go ahead and take the smallest of all these, so I do two to the first, three to the zero, five to the zero, and seven to the first, that ends up being 14, and that's the greatest common divisor. 
So we want to check if the greatest common divisor of 168 times 490 times the least common multiple of 168 and 490, does that equal 168 times 490? So that's the thing we want to check. So the greatest common divisor, we saw that was 14. The least common multiple we saw was 5,880. And does that equal 168 times 490? And if you do this on a calculator, you end up getting 8, 2, 3, 2, 0. And on this side, you get 8, 2, 3, 2, 0. So yes, it does indeed work. Okay, so let's look at an outline of how we might prove this. So let's see here. First, I'm going to define some notation here. Let's say that the greatest common divisor of A and B, we'll call that D for divisor, and the least common multiple of A and B, I will call that M for multiple. And so based off of this, I need to show, so this is what I need, I need to show that D times M equals A times B. And here's the strategy. So this is a way to show something like this. And this is kind of similar to what we did when we wanted to show that two sets were equal. I'm going to show that DM divides AB, and I'm going to show that AB divides DM. And if I do that, since all these numbers are positive, then that should show that DM equals AB. And so first off, let's look at dm dividing ab. So that's the first part I want to look at here. Okay. Well, um, let's see. I know that if n, say, is a common multiple, let's say that n is a common multiple of a and b here. Common multiple of a and b. Then I know that m divides n. So how do I know that? Well, this is the second part up here. For any integer n, if a divides n and b divides n, then m divides n. So that's what I know from this. And so if m divides n, then md divides nd. That's a way of getting uh, d times m involved in this. And so all I need to do is really think of a clever choice here for n that's going to also allow me to show that m times d divides a times b. And well, how about if I choose n to be, it has to be something with an a and a b in it, and then how about if I divide out the d? Something like that. Okay. Now, let's see here. Um, if I were to look at this as a over d times b, that would show that n is a multiple of b. And if I were to look at this as b times d, b over d times a, that would show that n is a multiple of a. And how do I know that a over d and b over d, how do I know that these things are integers? Well, remember that d is the greatest common divisor. So of course, a divides d evenly and b divides d evenly. So this should work. And once I've done that, then I think I can say that I have dm dividing ab. Okay, so that's kind of the first part. Now I have to do the reverse, a, b divides d times m. How am I gonna do that? Well, let's see. Um, I know that there is a way to rewrite the greatest common divisor here as, oh, let's say u times a plus v times b. That was one of the things we had shown in an earlier video where these u's, u and v here are integers. Okay, in fact, I'll write here, u and v are integers. So I want d times m involved here, so I'm just gonna multiply everything times m here, so I get u a m plus v b m, all right? And remember, though, that the least common multiple here uh, is m, so that means that m is a, a constant times a, and it's also a constant times b. In other words, I can write m as, say, r times a, and I can also write m as, say, s times b. So if I do that, and then I kind of substitute back in here, I get u, a, s, b, and I get v, b, r, a, and I think you see what happens here. I can rewrite this as u, s plus v, b, 
uh, I'm sorry, VR, all times AB. And that means that DM must be a constant times AB because this thing right here is a constant, and so AB must divide DM. Okay, I think we're ready for an actual proof here. Okay, so here's the proof. Let the greatest common divisor of A and B be D, and let the least common multiple of A and B be M. And I want to show that DM equals AB. So first, I'm going to show that DM divides AB. So I'm going to choose N to be A times B over D. And then I can say that N is A over D times B. And since A over D is an integer, by the definition of the greatest common divisor, N has to be a multiple of B. And remember that a over d is an integer because remember d is the greatest common divisor. So of course a divided by d has to be an integer. And likewise, I can also think of n as b over d times a, which means then that n is a multiple of a. Since n is a common multiple of a and b, it must be true that little m divides n. And so d times m must divide dn, which is equal to a times b. All right, now how about the other way around? A times B divides D times M. How am I going to show that? Well, there exist integers U and V such that D equals U times A plus V times B. That was just writing the greatest common divisor using linear combination here of A and B. So therefore, DM equals UAM plus VBM. But by the definition of the least common multiple, M is R times A, and it's also S times B for some integers R and S. And so I can rewrite dm just by plugging those in and then factoring out an a times b. And since us plus vr is an integer, it must be true that ab divides dm.